First, make sure that the slot you installed the SCSI card in is set to your card. In this case, that's slot 7, and it's properly set. Use the up and down arrow keys to move the light bar to the appropriate slot. Then use the right and left arrow keys to change it if necessary. Then make sure that the startup slot at the bottom of the screen is set to the slot you installed the SCSI card in. If you installed the SCSI card in slot 7, you can also leave this set to scan. If it's not set properly, use the up and down arrow keys to move to the startup slot, then change it with the left and right arrow keys. Finally, press return to save the settings. Press escape and return to close the control panel. Then turn off the computer, wait 10 seconds, and try again. If none of these solutions work, give our technical support department a call. We should be able to solve your problem in only a few minutes. If you get a message that says unable to load ProDOS, turn the computer off and try it again to make sure that the computer is not trying to boot off one of the other disk drives. If it is, then rewind to the previous section for more information on troubleshooting this problem. If that's not the problem, it's time to check one other thing. Turn the power off on the computer and take the top back off. Touch the power supply to discharge static electricity. Then pull the SCSI card out of its slot. Find the block of switches at the bottom front of the SCSI card and change switch 1 to the open position. You can use a small screwdriver, the cap from a ballpoint pen, or your fingernail. Now reinstall the card and try the startup procedure again. Switch 1 on the SCSI card controls the card's use of DMA. DMA is a technique which allows interface cards to move data very quickly. However, there are some memory cards and accelerators and other interface cards that are incompatible with DMA. You want to leave DMA turned on if possible because DMA makes the hard drive run slightly faster. However, for now, turn it off to see if that solves your problem. If changing the setting of switch 1 solves your problem, then you have at least one card in your computer which is not DMA compatible. Turn DMA back on and remove cards one at a time until the SCSI card works. The last card you took out is probably not DMA compatible. If this hasn't solved your problem, please contact our technical support department for more in-depth troubleshooting. If the computer just sits there displaying the startup screen, that usually means that the computer has found the SCSI card but that the SCSI card can't find the drive. If you wait long enough, the computer will eventually boot your floppy drive or give you the check startup device message. Turn off all power and make sure that the cables are connected securely at both ends. Also, make sure that the terminator included with the drive is installed. Finally, make sure that the SCSI ID is set to 6 or lower. Now turn on the Q-Drive's power. The green light on the front of the drive should come on. If it doesn't, make sure that the power cord is plugged in and that the outlet it's plugged into has power. Now turn on the computer. If the drive still doesn't work, call our technical support department. There may be something wrong with the drive. Stay tuned for more helpful tips on using your Q-Drive. Now that your Q-Drive is installed and working properly, here are some tips to help you get the most out of it. The first and most important tip is to be sure to read the manual. There's a lot of stuff in there that you need to know about, especially if you've never used a hard drive before. It may be tempting to skip the manual, especially since you've already got the drive up and running. But trust me, the time you spend reading the manual is time well invested and could save you hours of frustration. Here's another manual you may find useful. This one comes in the box with the Apple SCSI card. But be careful. There are instructions in this manual for formatting and partitioning a new hard drive and preparing it to receive data. Don't follow these instructions. 
We've already formatted and partitioned the drive and installed system software on it, so you don't need to do that again. And in fact, if you do do it again, you'll erase everything that's already on the drive, including the free software we included. And there's no way to get that stuff back on there without sending us the drive. So do read these manuals and do study them well, but be very careful about following any instructions you read in the Apple SCSI card manual. Now, on to some more specific help information. If you have an Apple IIGS, you may be interested to know that the Q drive contains both System 5 and System 6. System 6 is a new version of the 2GS system software, which can read Macintosh disks and print to a StyleWriter printer. It has a lot of other new features, too. The Q drive normally starts up with System 5. If you have at least 2 megabytes of RAM and would like to try System 6, you can use the Q drive's exclusive switch hitter program. To activate switch hitter, just hold down the control key while you turn on the 2GS. It will take a few seconds for the switch hitter screen to appear. There we go. The switch hitter screen displays the current system software the drive is using at the top of the screen. To switch to system six, just press the number six. The switchover takes only a few seconds. When the switchover is complete, press R to restart the computer and you're using system six. To return to using System 5, just hold down the control key while starting up, and then press 5 when the switch hitter screen appears, and press R to restart. There you go, back to System 5. The Q drive does not come with System 6 manuals or disks. If you need these, you can buy the Quality Computer System 6 package for $29.95, or the Apple System 6 package for $49.95. And by the way, don't forget to check out the switch hitter instruction sheet for more details on how to use this program. The Q drive comes with system software called the Finder. The Finder allows you to work with the Q drive and your other disks simply by pointing and clicking the mouse. We're going to take you on a brief tour of the Finder now. Don't consider this an in-depth tutorial, but it will get you started. This is the Finder. You'll notice that there are several small pictures or icons here on the right side of the screen. The Finder uses icons to represent things you can work with. These are your Q drive's partitions, and this here is a three and a half inch disk. If you click an icon once, it turns black. We call this selecting an icon. In the Finder, first you select the icon or icons you want to work with, then you tell the Finder what to do with those icons. So let's do something with this icon. The Finder's menu bar provides instant access to all the Finder's features. Move the pointer to the menu bar and hold down the mouse button to display a menu. If you move the mouse back and forth across the menu, the different menus you have access to will drop down. Release the mouse button to stop displaying the menu. And you can move the mouse down into the menu to select an option from it. This time we'll tell the Finder to open the icon. As you can see, the Finder opens a window to display the contents of the disk. The icons in this window represent documents, applications, and folders that are on this disk. Of course, once you've opened a window, you can also close it. We could do it from the File menu, but here's a shortcut. Just click the Close box in the upper left-hand corner of the window, and that'll make the window go away. And here's another shortcut, uh, which is useful for opening a window. Instead of clicking the icon once and then selecting Open from the File menu, just click the icon twice quickly. That's called double-clicking, and it has exactly the same effect as opening it from the File menu. In fact, double-clicking is so much faster, hardly anybody ever uses the File menu to open icons.